Hey, good morning and welcome to Partners Outdoors 2020 in perfect uh, Zoom webinar virtual world fashion. I know some folks had uh, trouble logging in. So um, thanks so much for sticking with us. We have an awesome program and I'm just so excited about all the people popping in. Uh, Thanks for joining us after um, Memorial Day weekend, and um, we're excited for a great two days. You can follow along in Hoover with everything that will be taking place. I am Jessica Wall, the Executive Director of the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. ORR is America's leading coalition of outdoor recreation, trade associations, and organizations really working together to promote the growth of all outdoor recreation activities. We're made up of 34 national associations representing over 110,000 businesses across the entire outdoor recreation sector who produce a 788 billion in economic output. ORR educates decision makers and the public on balanced priorities that conserve public lands and waterways and enhance infrastructure to improve the experience and quality of life of recreation enthusiasts everywhere and across the wide breadth of outdoor recreation activities. Advancing these values is critical to growing outdoor recreation in the United States, which supports healthy people, places, economies, and communities. In the past, our industry from bikers and hikers to hunters and anglers to RVers and ATVers have come together to really uh, show the power of an industry that was once really siloed. Uh, the industry makes over 2% uh, of the gross domestic product in the United States and employs 5.2 million Americans which is over 3% of all employees in the US. So we contribute more to the US economy than industries like agriculture and mining and utilities. And we're economic drivers in every corner of the country. So the siloed sector has come together. We're making the pie bigger instead of fighting over slices of the pie to improve recreation experiences for everyone, no matter what their recreation activity is. I want to give a special thanks to the Partners Outdoors Planning Committee, which is made up of ORR members and all the federal land and water management agencies for helping to put together a phenomenal program in a short period of time as we decided how to convene this year. With their help, the small but mighty team at ORR has put together an informative and thought provoking, hopefully very solution solution oriented discussion for the next two days. This is our first and hopefully last time having a virtual conference. So please bear with us with any technical issues if they continue to arise. But the silver lining really is that so many more people are able to join us uh, in what was traditionally once a small in-person convening uh, in DC. We've got a lot of groups uh, that have signed up this year and we hope to continue to advance uh, more participation in future years. We'll be recording the conference and hope you have the opportunity to introduce yourself to your peers during the action item sessions that will happen over the course of the next two days. Zoom can provide ADA closed captioning if that is needed. And again, please use Whova to follow along for any of our sessions. So a little background on Partners Outdoors, if this is your first time, because I think there are a lot of first timers. Uh, it's been going on for nearly 30 years and uh, it's really been the, the premier venue where stakeholders from across the public and private sectors could convene to discuss the future of outdoor recreation. Partners Outdoors was an outgrowth of the President's Commission on America Great Outdoors, which started in 1985. And every year, the public and private sectors have come together to discuss public lands and water issues and really uh, embrace networking opportunities, which I hope we can have a little bit of um, virtually and then go back to in person next year. Past Partners Outdoors discussions have led to new legislation, better management, and increased funding for recreation. As in the past, the conference really centers around solving key challenges facing outdoor recreation through public-private partnerships, sustainable funding models for all outdoor recreation activities, conservation and stewardship of our natural resources, and changing workforce needs, diversifying the outdoor experiences and visitor expectations, and other key issues that engage the next generation of outdoor recreationists. We're so lucky to have a great lineup of speakers and presenters from the White House, the Department of Agriculture, the National Park Service, NOAA, Army Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service, as well as our ORR members and cross-sector business CEOs and university professionals all joining us this day, today and tomorrow to work on these important issues. This year's key topics fit into the four themes of impacts of COVID-19 on outdoor recreation, recreation and conservation working together, 21st century outdoor recreation workforce and the future of outdoor recreation management and policy. I first wanna take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, KOA, uh, for making this conference possible. 
Camp Grants of America Inc. is the world's largest system of open to the public campgrounds with more than 520 locations across the US and Canada. KOA serves more than a million camping families each year who rely on the standards of excellence and unique outdoor adventure that KOA is known across the globe for. We have a short video from our partners at KOA and we'll hear from KOA's CEO in the next session. So we'll play the video real quick. Consider this your invitation out to a place where you can relax, recharge, and have fun. Where every moment in the outdoors is a breath of fresh air. Where getting away from it all brings you closer together. Where the outside changes you on the inside. This is what you've been waiting for. Make your way out. Thanks, KOA, and um, a good note uh, on the on adding sessions to your agenda. I don't think you can enter in Whova if you don't have the sessions on your agenda. So make sure you add all the sessions that you want to participate in onto your agenda so you can get right in as they open. So we're thrilled to have Lisa Onbrug here with us today, the Executive Director of the Outdoor Industry Association to kick us off this morning. Before her role at OIA and the Outdoor Foundation, Lisa was the Executive Vice President of the National Park Foundation and Executive Director of the Great Outdoors Colorado Trust Fund. She's really been in the forefront of many conversations that we will have today, especially around youth and the outdoors and how businesses can support conservation. In the spirit of Partners Outdoors, Lisa is a true collaborator, always bringing people and ideas to the table to move forward on a collective goal. Lisa, thanks for having uh, us on your schedule today and let you take it from here. Thanks, Jess. I can't see if I'm on. You are. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, we're all still, even though we've had a year of the pandemic, I think we're all still getting used to uh, virtual formats. As Jess said, I'm Lisa Ongebrook. I'm the Executive Director of the Outdoor Industry Association and we're a member trade association of a thousand outdoor companies ranging from small specialty retailers like Angler's Covey to large companies like REI, Patagonia, and the North Face. And we're proud members of the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. We're really fortunate today to be joined by Congressman Joe Naguz. Representative Naguz was tapped in February to lead the House Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands. He represents the district where my organization, the Outdoor Industry Association, is based, and it's a place that highly values conservation, trails, parks, and all forms of outdoor recreation in a state with a really robust outdoor economy. The Congressman well understands the challenges and opportunities facing our public lands and our industries. The outdoor economy is growing. After being hit hard at the beginning of the pandemic, many outdoor businesses are thriving and growing at rates higher than pre-pandemic, as more people are connecting outside. The outdoors is more popular than ever. Outdoor industry and our charitable arm, the Outdoor Foundation recently completed some studies that show a dramatic increase in participation for many activities, most notably hiking, fishing, and camping, and participation by a more diverse and more urban population highlighting the really important need for close to home outdoor recreation opportunities. At the same time, we know that not everyone has nearby access to parks, trails, and open spaces. Recent data from the Trust for Public Land indicates that 100 million people or 300 million, 30 million children do not have access to a park within a 10 minute walk. And we know that access is not the only barrier. At the same time, our public lands and communities are heavily impacted by a changing and warming climate. Wildfires ravaged many Western forests last year and drought still grips big swaths of the West. Fortunately, we have a champion in Congressman Naguz to help us conserve public lands, address backlogs in repairing and improving outdoor recreation infrastructure, managing our forests for wildfire and creating new opportunities and jobs outdoors. As a freshman legislator, Congressman Naguz prioritized conservation and public lands, ensuring that the Great American Outdoors Act passed and introducing the 21st Century Conservation Corps for our Health and Jobs Act. And this session, in addition to becoming chair of the House Subcommittee on National, For National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands, he introduced the Civilian Climate Corps Act, 
along with other conservation bills that will help address devastating wildfires and spur economic development in rural communities. He also ushered in a public lands package through the House, which included the Colorado Outdoor Recreation Economy Act, which would grow our economy and protect 400,000 acres of public land. His recently introduced Bipartisan Parks, Jobs, and Equity Act would provide funding to make sure urban parks are accessible and underserved communities benefit from outdoor spaces. His leadership on issues that affect public lands and waters and urban and rural access to outdoor jobs, parks, and open spaces benefit every American. It is my pleasure now to turn it over to one of our strongest outdoor and conservation advocates in Congress, Congressman Joe Naguz. Hello everyone. It is so great to join you for Partners Outdoor 2021. In Colorado, as you know, like much of the Rocky Mountain West, our outdoor recreation economy and access to public lands are simply part of our way of life. Outdoor recreation contributes to our physical and mental health and our economic health, contributing literally billions of dollars to our state's growth each year. As chair of the National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands Subcommittee, and as representative to treasured places like Rocky Mountain National Park, Arapaho National Forest, and areas across Summit and Eagle Counties in Colorado, preserving these places, investing in outdoor access, and building a brighter future for the next generation is incredibly important to me. It's why I've introduced a number of different bills, including legislation to establish the 21st Century Civilian Climate Corps. It's a bold proposal, in my view, that will put hundreds of thousands of Americans back to work training the next generation of climate and resiliency workers and supporting our communities by assisting our wildland firefighters with fire suppression, restoring our lands through road maintenance and trail restoration, construction to reduce the maintenance backlog on our public lands and international parks. Our plan would invest in our Western economies. It would support the outdoor recreation industry. It would expand access to the outdoors and it would support the lands that we love. In short, we're taking a page out of FDR's playbook. We want to reimagine the Conservation Corps of the 1930s. The 21st Century Corps will prioritize equity and inclusion, help us tackle the climate crisis, put people back to work, and help us address wildfires across the West all at the same time. We're excited that President Biden included our proposed $10 billion fund for the Conservation Corps as he unveiled the American Jobs Plan and reiterated his support for increasing the natural resource workforce in the outline that he proposed for our public lands just recently. So we're excited to get to work, as you can imagine, making this a reality and investing in the lands that we love. I'm also proud to lead the bipartisan SOAR Act, legislation that would directly support our outdoor guides by easing the permitting process, ensuring more individuals can visit our beautiful places and more guides can easily operate and run their businesses. When we invest in the outdoors, we all benefit. We can build a brighter future for the next generation, for Colorado and for the West. So again, a big thank you to Outdoor Recreation Roundtable for hosting Partner Outdoors 2021 for continuing to advocate for the lands that we love, for the outdoor recreation economy, for our environment, and above all else, for our communities. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and stay hopeful. Thank you, Lisa and Congressman Naguz, uh, for your leadership in this space. And we're really excited to work uh, with the Congressman and OIA on things like the SOAR Act and the Civilian Climate Conservation Corps, as the Congressman mentioned. We're going to start our next framing panel portion of the program with a relevant discussion of the impacts of COVID-19 on outdoor recreation. So as we've all seen, as more of the country begins to open up from COVID-19 related closures, the outdoor recreation community faces a unique opportunity to take stock of the impacts of the pandemic on our industry and visitors and enhance and ensure Americans newfound love and enjoyment of the outdoors is fostered and new and diverse outdoor participants are excited to keep coming back. This panel will explore how the impacts of COVID-19 have changed outdoor recreation for both the public and private sectors 
and how we can ensure that the uptick in participation and visitation that we saw over the past year leads to the sustainable growth of our industry and of a more diverse and equitable industry for years to come. With us to take a look at how COVID-19 has impacted recreation across the country are Toby O'Rourke, President and CEO of Campgrounds of America, Stephanie Vazzolero, Senior Vice President and of Marketing and Communications with the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, and Reggie Chapel, Acting Assistant Director for Partnerships and Civic Engagement with the National Park Service. So Toby, I'll kick it off to you to get us started. Great. Well, thanks, Jessica, for having me. Um, I was very pleased to be invited, and I'd love to talk about the outdoor recreation industry, and particularly um, for by way of introduction, I focus on camping. So as she said, my name is Toby O'Rourke. I'm the president and CEO of Campgrounds of America. We're the world's largest network of private campgrounds with 525 locations across the United States and Canada. We've been in business for almost 60 years. So we've got a lot of decades of experience behind us and um, we are committed to connecting people with the outdoors and each other. That's the mission of our company. And there is no greater mission to have than, than that over this past year or so as we've gone through the pandemic and seen the effects on the outdoors. And that's what I was gonna share for a few minutes about the effects we've seen on camping. Just to level set, there are a lot of people who camp and you may not be aware of this, but 86 million households, according to our research, consider themselves campers. It's a great deal of people across the United States and Canada who camp on a regular basis. We have seen that steadily increasing year over year for the past seven to 10 years when we first started measuring this data. And if, you know, to put it in perspective, our best year on record was 2019. So again, prior to pandemic was the best year in our company's history. But we saw a surge of an increase in interest in camping last year, this time during the pandemic. We estimate 10.1 million households camped for the first time last year. The reasons they were doing so were to escape stress. They were looking you know, to achieve the mental health benefits of being in the outdoors looking to avoid crowds, looking for affordable vacation options. And camping can provide great flexibility as people were working and schooling from anywhere. And that definitely extended into the fall. We're seeing some of that still this spring and summer. But ultimately they, were, they had viewed camping and road tripping as a safer vacation alternative. So many people were shying away from airplanes and other forms of vacation options. And we actually did some research around this asking people to rank different vacation options in terms of their perception of safety and both campers and non-campers alike ranked camping at the top of that list. We did that research in the spring, we did that again in the fall, and again this spring, and that has held up consistently that people view camping as a safe vacation option. You know, that's obviously driven by the natural social distancing of being in the outdoors. You know, I have a picture of a campsite behind me. There's space, you know, a lot of space between campsites. And a lot of people are coming in RVs, such as shown in this picture, that, you know, this is your own equipment, you have your own bathrooms, your own kitchen, and again, that flexibility. So this is a great alternative for vacations in, in the time of COVID. So this, as we're seeing all these new campers coming in and we're headed now into 2021, we're seeing them come back. Very healthy outlook for the year ahead. Oh, you know, a majority of those new campers said they were going to camp again. We're definitely seeing that play out in our numbers. Our business, for example, is up 30% over where it was in 2019, which again was our best year on history in history. And we're 66% ahead for advanced deposits. So those forward-looking reservations, which indicates we're going to have a very, very busy year. As we think about this new camper base that came in through COVID, you know, there's definitely trends that we're continuing from what we had seen before, but there are things that are helping us understand this future camper. Definitely shifting younger, 58% of new campers last year were millennials or Gen Z. Families, three quarters of those new camp campers were families, which is great. And what we see as we can introduce children into the activity, the more likely they are to continue that as an adult, but also more diverse. And we're very excited to see that 60% of new campers last year were from non-white groups. As I said, people were gravitating towards RVs. Ownership rates jumped, and we're seeing that again continuing to play out this year. People were also looking for unique accommodations and cabins. We actually estimate that half of those new camper households, over 5 million, 
came to the activity because of some interest in glamping, so cabins or some form of unique accommodation. With this healthy outlook we're seeing, uh, we definitely urge for investment in campground improvements. There's a lot of economic interest in campgrounds from the private sector. There's a lot of money coming into camping, a lot of people building campgrounds for the first time in decades, and people are expanding their parks and adding more campgrounds. We'd love to see that investment continue on the private side as well as the public side. In order to meet this healthy demand, we need to keep, make sure, keep ensuring that we're providing good, comfortable, safe places for people to camp. And you know, as we get through the rest of the panel, more than happy to answer more questions about the effects of COVID on camping and what that future outlook looks like. Thank you, Toby. Your data has been so instrumental uh, for ORR and our partners to use to um, get congressional relief for the outdoor industry and just talk to the agencies about what's happening. So we really appreciate KOA and all the work that you've done on that. A similar data that we've been using comes from the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. And um, Stephanie's here to talk about, uh, just like camping, another sector, uh, fishing and boating that has seen a dramatic increase over COVID. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to join you today. This is my first partner outdoors, and, and thanks ORR for having me. Um, I'm just going to dive right into it. Thank you, Toby, for, for setting that up. Um, I think you're going to hear a lot of the same themes when it comes to fishing and boating, uh, but let me throw up on my screen here some slides I prepared to give you a visual. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, as everyone knows, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic kind of challenged us in ways that we never imagined and, and was really a hardship for a lot of people. But if there had to be a silver lining, uh, the outdoor industry and certainly fishing and boating really saw a huge uh, surge in participation, which in our activity means that more dollars went to aquatic conservation. Um, that's pretty cool. So how big was that increase? Uh, we saw roughly 55 million Americans age six plus go fishing in 2020. And if you look at that chart, you can see that's a, a big uptick of about 5 million since 2019. Uh, we don't have boating participation data for 2020, but we do know that 100,000 people bought their first boat in 2020 and new boat sales are at a 13 year high. So clearly uh, those trends uh, go together. Uh, we saw tremendous gains in our key segments. Um, youth was the highest rate since 2007 for ages 13 to 17. Uh, women now make up 36% of all fishing participants at an all-time high 19.7 million. Uh, 4.8 million Hispanics also at an all-time high and double the number in 20, uh, 2007. And 3.1 million African Americans, which is up a million over the last 10 years. We also saw a really big uptick in new participants, which went to 4.4 million from 3.1. And we reactivated 9 million folks this year. That means we got them back into the sport after they had kind of left it for a while. Um, so all really, really good, good indicators. Now we think there's an opportunity, uh, as Toby said, I, I fully agree, uh, for continued growth in fishing and boating. Uh, we've been really plugged into Harris Poll this year and kind of following uh, the trends that are happening there, which things are changing on a weekly basis. And some of the key things that stuck out to us, um, really Americans found a new appreciation or a renewed appreciation for the outdoors during the pandemic. So there's this great appreciation there. The safety and the sanity aspect, 65% turned to outdoor activities to stay safe and sane. Uh, people being home and less time commuting, they had more time for activities like fishing and boating. And then, you know, a lot of people saved money, they canceled trips, and they are ready to spend now. 2020's new anglers and boaters were young, more diverse than they've ever been, and from urban locations. So, you know, we did this research uh, to find out, you know, who these folks were, which revealed what's on your screen right now, but we also wanted to know, you know, what's going to keep them coming back. Um, to secure the future of our sport, we really have to focus on these groups. These are the future of fishing and boating. And what they need this year 
to come back to the sport, we need to really nurture our relationships with them. We need to, as brands, as companies, as associations and agencies, you know, send them reminders about all the amazing times they had on the water last year. Share local information with them. They want to know where they can go fishing and boating and outdoor adventuring near them. We want to make it easy, give them how-to videos, show them, you know, how the basics and where to go and what to do. Uh, social, this was a big social thing in 2020 and emphasize those things to keep people engaged. And then also, you know, give them advice. Uh, customer service today isn't just sell a product and walk away. People really want that kind of one stop. I can get all the information uh, I need. Our organization, RBFF, and our brands, Take Me Fishing and Vamos a Pescar, we're doing a few things to keep engaging those newcomers this year. We are increasing our investment in consumer outreach. Um, those are advertising, PR campaigns, social media, website content, all of the above. We're also entering some new advertising channels, including streaming. Um, this is where the newcomers are really uh, consuming media. Uh, so we are also working on some new integrated partnerships to make things more mainstream. We're talking your BuzzFeed, uh, Complex, Hulu. Um, and we've also uh, added to our content budget. Video is something that has taken off extremely well for us in the last couple of years and is making up a huge chunk of our content. So finally, um, we are also want to help other uh, fishing and boating uh, organizations reach out to their own consumers and retain those newcomers. So we've built a toolkit, gobtoolkit.com, quick registration, and you can get access to all of our get on board campaign resources. Um, even if your company just kind of barely touches on fishing and boating, like camping, there's a big crossover. Check it out. There might be something uh, useful for you in there. So there's a whole lot more data where this came from. So please feel free to reach out to me uh, with any questions or I'm happy to stick around and answer some questions later too. Thank you so much, ORR. I appreciate being involved in this. Thank you, Stephanie. And, uh, you know, Reggie, I would love your thoughts on the National Park Service efforts to attract and retain new participation as Stephanie and Toby mentioned, you know, there's been an uptick in participation, but we also saw that there was a uh, you know, a real um, severe downturn in some park visitation because of COVID. So I know there's been a lot of insights and looking forward to hearing you. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, Toby and Stephanie. And, and thank you, ORR, Partners Outdoors. It's just glad, glad to be here with you all today. It, it's been a rough year, but things are looking up. And so uh, that's the great news. And some of the good news is stuff like this. I don't know if you can see it, but it's our um, Think Like a Ranger or Plan Like a Ranger. Um, the kinds of information that we are now putting out, um, and this came out, I think, last Friday. And so these are things that folks can look forward to, because what we're seeing is that there is an uptick in reservations to campgrounds. We're seeing that um, parks are getting uh, reservations for uh, the, the local hotels that are there in both the Gateway community and on the park sites. Um, we're also seeing places like Kalispell, Montana, to get to Glacier. Um, National Park that flights are being sold out. And so that's the that's the good news. And all of this is happening over a year when we're also implementing the Great American Outdoors Act, um, increasing um, the kinds of facilities that we have and bringing them up to code and so that there is um, less deferred maintenance on our, our, our park sites. We've got campground modernization that's happening. And we're also continuing to work on um, co working coalitions uh, with things like recreate responsibly. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what our response has been over the past year. Um, but I also want to talk about, you know, give you some statistics on, on what's actually happened. Um, as, you're, as you're hearing, we are down 90 million um, recreation visits from 2019. And so we've had 237 million recreation visits in 2020. Um, all of our other categories of overnight stays, hours are down too. And this is based on 389 of our 422 parks reporting from 2020. And so we've had the lowest visitation in recreation in 40 years. And so we've not seen 
these kinds of numbers since 1980, really. Um, and so most of our decreases happened in um, national um, urban parks in the National Park Service, um, which is down over 51 million visits. Um, so, but despite the lower visitation overall, we've had some parks to set um, records. And so um, we've had parks like um, Indiana Dunes um, outside of Chicago and, and Lake Michigan to actually set records because of their, we believe, because of their um, location next to major urban centers and folks wanting to get outdoors and, and recreate locally. And so we're seeing that happen amongst our own parks. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of background on what we did internally in the park service as well, because there's an external facing that's impacting the outdoor recreation industry. Um, but there's also stuff that we did internally. So we set up an incident management team um, within the National Park Service to really um, work with our leadership to actually put out messages to staff and for them to feed in messages to us as well. And so in the early months of that incident uh, management team, um, we began to actually record um, visitation numbers and to record um, COVID-19 impacts. And so we also began listening to our partners and we're continuing to do that more and more um, so that we can actually hear from you all of what it is that you all need from us and how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted you. Um, we have a partnerships page um, on our National Park Service um, website and it's called um, partnerships backslash it's a subject site. If you go there and look for our toolkit, uh, you'll actually see all of the updated information for partners as well. And so in the previous administration, um, the department initiated a series of tracking tools. And so we continue to actually use that. Um, and then parks have been instructed to use a risk management assessment tool. And so, and that continues to feed us as well. So um, President Biden issued executive order 13991 um, and that is what we are currently using to actually guide us in terms of our um, social distancing and mask mandate in parks. Um, I just wanna give you a little bit of a kind of an example of an impact that has happened in region. And I'll, and I'll use the national capital area, which is where the national mall is. So uh, Washington DC area, Virginia, and some parts of Maryland. Uh, at one point, as many as 200 people of our workforce actually called out on COVID safety leave. And so that impacted our ability to actually um, serve the visitor and maintain the visitor experience. And so we had to actually work with the federal government to actually hire additional um, staff. And so um, currently we have about 130 folks still out. Um, but what that has done for us is to impact us in, in terms of um, losing about $10 million in productivity. And overall in the National Park Service, there's been $41 million of productivity lost over uh, the past year. Um, so the NPS then started working on solutions. So what is it that we could actually do? And so um, in FY20 and 21, uh, the department has made $33.7 million of CARES Act funding available uh, to the National Park Service. And we've used about $2 million of that to actually help our staff with the um, kind of COVID-19 um, mask and other personal protective equipment. Um, so we know that many of our concessioners and, and operators have lost revenue as well. Just as we have been impacted, you all have been impacted too. And those impacts have varied across locations. Um, and so I'll give an example of how things are improving though. Um, the marina and boat rentals are performing at a higher level in most, most places than um, 2019 levels. Um, conversely, operators such as the ferry at the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island um, and the food and beverage operations at this monument were down as much as 85% or more. Um, and now what we're seeing is that there is an uptick and that we are going to be able to return to full operations there um, probably around June 19th. And so we're beginning to see these improvements and those improvements are also coming from listening sessions um, with you all. Um, the, the NPS continues to comply with the president's executive order on protecting the federal workforce. 
and we're still issuing memos. As things are updated at the local level or the CDC level, we continue to issue memos out to the staff so that they can inform our partners on how we need to continue to operate, what our current operational posture is. Um, yeah, and so I will, I will stop there just in general and just allow us to have the um, Q&A and just an open conversation, but I wanted to give you all a sense of what was happening and then we can have a greater conversation in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Reggie. That's really interesting to have insight into what was going on in the Park Service. We obviously see so much happening, um, you know, from the outside. And I just wonder what you and the other panelists worry about most um, that will impact, you know, outdoor engagement and all the planning that you've made and everything you've undergone in the past year during COVID as things open back up and, and maybe people return to their traditional work environments, um, you know, spending less time with family, maybe there's more travel. Uh, what impact do you think that will have on the parks and, and Toby on camping and, and Stephanie on boating and fishing? Um, and how do you think we can all work together to make sure we kind of keep the great things that happened uh, during COVID for outdoor recreation and also, you know, uh, work through some of the challenges that we saw? Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, so all of our parks aren't fully operational yet. And so that all the sites um, at a park aren't all um, operational. And so that might be an impact for folks. And so we're also trying out different kinds of methods of um, timed entry or trying to use some new technologies so that we can manage flow in parks. And so folks might see a bit of a delay um, and we're asking that you actually plan ahead of time and that you make reservations and don't just show up at a park um, because you'll be disappointed and where we'll have to turn you away uh, because we're trying to manage the visitor experience based on um, the amount of the facilities that are open at a particular park and to maintain social distancing and safety and all of the local um, kind of ordinances that may be in, a, in that may, may be in effect at a park site so that we can maintain the visitor experience. And so, so those are some of the things that um, we can expect. And that's at the same time as our concessioners, our commercial youth auth authorization holders are actually seeing record numbers of um, of bookings. And so there's this kind of balance. It looks like it's sold out. It looks like it's limited, but we're also at the same time breaking records. Yeah, I would build off that uh, similar to park reservations. Camping reservations are more important than ever because campgrounds are, are filling up very quickly. And so we're always um, encouraging guests to make reservations. But I think as we as an industry can continue to um, you know, improve quality of site so that we can meet the demand that's coming, that that's most important. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, each each one of these activities is a little bit different. With fishing and boating, I think one of the reasons it it did take off the way it did is because you don't need reservations and you can go in your neighborhood uh, park or pond or, or whatnot. It's very, very accessible. Um, but I think the key thing uh, for everyone who plays a hand in fishing from the person who sells the tackle to the state agencies who sell the fishing license to everyone along in the process is this idea of consumer engagement. Um, people are just bombarded with info these days. And if they can go one place and get everything they need and that brand or that company is nurturing, you know, here's some tips on where to go and here's how you tie knots and, and do whatnot. That's, that's really what we're uh, promoting as, as everybody's job. <laughs> 